Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And this is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and we both welcome you back to yet another episode of The New World Next Week, which, of course, you can find at NewWorldNextWeek.com. High quality, low quality, audio, video, everything you need to get, share, view, and spread this show, which is all about alternative news and open source intelligence. James, we will get right into it this week with our first story that we'll take from Niall Bowie on the changing face of Pyongyang, which, of course... Everyone knows Kim Jong-il passed away this past week, or at least was announced that he passed away this past week. Hereditary succession under close scrutiny of elite U.S. policymakers. Somber scenes of hysterical crowds mourning the recent death of Kim Jong-il before Pyongyang's immense paintings and concrete monuments have triggered mass speculation regarding the country's future leadership and political climate. Outside the borders of North Korea, Asian financial markets immediately dive due to fears of regional instability. Uncertainty personifies the regime and the legitimacy of its successor amid concerns of an internal power struggle between senior political and military officials. As other countries deemed non-compliant to the interests of the international community crumble under military intervention and foreign-funded people's revolutions, the existence of North Korea surely will have no place in the touted vision of America's Pacific Century. A report issued in 2009 by the Council on Foreign Relations, a prominent think tank instrumental in authoring U.S. foreign policy, has shed light on the advisable American response to the fluctuating climate of Pyongyang. The document, ostensibly titled Preparing for a Sudden Change in North Korea, attempts to foresee three future scenarios in a post-Kim political climate. A smooth transition under a managed succession, leaving the current ideological infrastructure intact. A contested succession in which government officials attempt to usurp power. And a failed succession where, succession where the new leadership cannot foster its legitimacy, triggering a chaos-induced collapse. Now, this is a massive piece that is on nilebowie.blogspot.com, and it is worth going through as all of these things are coming out. And James, you even sent me the update right before we started to roll here from The Guardian. South Korean intelligence disputes circumstances of Kim Jong-il's death. MPs in Seoul told that North Korean leader did not travel by train the day he died as Kim Jong-un consolidates power. Now, I have these and more updates on MediaMonarchy.com, but I want to remind folks, and we'll provide this link, the very last episode of The New World Next Week last year ended with a segment on New Year predictions for 2011. And we were pulling from a massive list on ZeroHedge.com, and I just pulled out a few that, that struck me as interesting. And the first two are, one, the ostensible end of the war in Iraq, which we've just recently seen, Mission accomplished. And number two was Kim Jong-il will die. So, James, hopefully there, in a way, we kind of lived up to our name of New World Next Week. Or New World Next Year, I suppose. Um, well, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, a very interesting story. And I, of the three options that were listed there in that CFR document, my, if I were mm -hmm. a betting man, I think this is going to be more of the smooth transition because we've seen them preparing for this for at least a year, a year and f a few months now anyway, since the uh, the su succession ceremony that they had in Pyongyang for Kim Jong-il's son. And I think, I think they've been preparing for this for an awfully long time, actually. And uh, in that Guardian article, it notes that uh, apparently Kim Jong-un had already issued the order for uh, forces to return to their bases uh, just before they uh, announced that uh, the day or so something before Kim Jong-il supposedly died. I think we can all agree that that's a completely ridiculous story and that he's been dead for some time and they've they've been preparing for this. So I I think this is going to be more of a smooth transition than, than a kind of collapse into chaos. But one never knows and the military might try something to try to take overt control of the country. But I think Kim Jong-un is just going to be a completely serviceable puppet to the powers that already exist there in North Korea. Because he's he is young, he's inexperienced, and uh, there's just no way that he's going to be really the leader. He, they'll just let him him be the figurehead in the same way Kim Jong-il was the figurehead. It's still, of course, an extremely tense moment here in East Asia, and of course Japan is keeping its eye on things, and South Korea obviously on high alert right now, so who knows, you know, these, these, these moments can always be used for some sort of big destabilization move, but uh, but at the moment I, I, I envision this being a much more smooth transition because I think really they have been planning for this for at least a year. 
that's that's probably the way I read it. And this was interesting. I did have a lot of folks kind of come up and want to talk about this and 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 speak about it, which I find interesting. What what stories rate kind of on the mass populace of people? But that's a sidebar. I I think yeah, it's meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And the only joke I kind of had about it was, gosh, you know, I'm glad here in America we don't have you know inbred ruling elite families that rule over us for generations propped up by military. But joking aside, James, we'll move to our second story from the Deutsche Press Agency. Manning opts not to testify in WikiLeaks hearing. Bradley Manning, the U.S. Army soldier accused of releasing reams of classified U.S. diplomatic data to Internet whistleblower WikiLeaks on Wednesday, and that is today here in the States, still December 21st, Accused of releasing reams of classified U.S. diplomatic data to WikiLeaks on Wednesday, today waived his option to testify at a military hearing on the case. Instead, Manning's attorney spent Wednesday using the hearing, which will determine if there's enough evidence for a court-martial, to question witnesses whose testimony they hope will exonerate him. The hearing is expected to conclude Thursday, the 22nd, with closing arguments after seven days of testimony and legal arguments. A verdict is expected by mid-January 2012. The first five days of the hearing have seen the prosecution try to establish a clear link between Manning and Julian Assange. Those include chat protocols between the two. The defense is focused on Manning's emotional problems, trying to argue that a soldier with gender identification issues like Manning should have never been let near classified data. They also noted that he was prone to violence and disobeyed orders, noting further that he should have been supervised. This article goes on to also mention that where he was staying, the computer center in Iraq, was insecure. Witnesses have described a workplace where soldiers worked without supervision, routinely downloading games and movies onto computers meant for classified data. I have, again, that and so much more posted on cyberspacewar.com. James? Well, again, there are so many fishy things about the entire Manning story and WikiLeaks and all of this, and, and just uh, just some of them include the, the so-called security provisions that the Pentagon maintains that are apparently more lax than pretty much any IT company in the private sector, and, uh, and uh, all of the ridiculousness about how he got the files and the fact that the, uh, the uh, what is it, collateral murder video was 256-bit AES encryption, which anyone who knows anything about encryption knows absolutely no way possible that uh, that WikiLeaks uh, cracked that decryption by themselves. So there's all sorts of things about that. And and uh, there were new revelations by Sibel Edmonds about things that were covered up in the uh, in the release of uh, the, the Cablegate thing from Turkey and all of that. So there are so many things that are fishy about this story. But what I find interesting is that this is a chance, at least for the general public, to see what uh, this new NDAA uh, legislation really means because we're getting a chance to see what an Ar- Article 32 military tribunal really looks like, where it does not look like average uh, criminal justice that that people might uh, the, the justice system that people might be familiar with in their their day to day lives. This is completely different, and in a military tribunal, uh, basically you have no rights whatsoever because the uh, the military can do whatever it wants with you, including locking you away for however long it's been now, what, a year or more? I don't even remember, but uh, locking you away for a very long time without any sort of trial. Um, and, and all of the things that they can do with NDAA, um, which they can now do to the average U.S. citizen, uh, that they arrest, arrest anyone anywhere in the world, including in the U.S. So um, this is just a chance to see what a military tribunal looks like, and it's not pretty. So I hope people understand what's, uh, what's coming down the line. And it's, you know, to drive that point home, it's, it's taking place at Fort Meade, the, you know, the home of the NSA, the National Security Agency. That, that should tell you something right there. Should tell you a few things, certainly. So, I mean, it's good to keep our eye on it, at least to see uh, what kind of circus spectacle they're rolling out in front of our eyes, because I have no doubt this is part of the PR for the, the coming military police state that they're trying to lock in with this new legislation. And it, I think, ties in with what we've seen in the past year with the sort of, you know, social media fueled uprisings around the world, which is the, you know, the cover story on the new issue of Wired. However, Mm -hmm. let's move to our our third and final story this week from Tony Cartolucci on Land Destroyer. U.S. troops guarded terrorist camp in Iraq. U.S. State Department now races to find a new home for U.S. State Department listed terrorist organization. In a move that almost defies belief and is so brazen and hypocritical, many will not believe it, no matter how many State Department officials confirm it. 
The U.S. has been guarding a terrorist training camp inside Iraq with U.S. troops and is planning to relocate them, possibly in a freshly abandoned U.S. military base in Iraq, while D.C. lobbyists work feverishly to have them delisted, armed, and sent to conduct terrorist operations in Iran. Foreign Policy magazine has reported in their article, State Department scrambling to move the MEK to a former U.S. military base? fully admits that Mujahideen e Kala, or e Kalk, rather, M-E-K, is a terrorist organization used by Saddam Hussein to attack Iran in the 1980s and was responsible for the death of U.S. military personnel and civilians. Foreign policy reports that efforts by the Iraqi army to evict the M-E-K has resulted in armed clashes. Foreign policy then reports the United Nations assistance mission in Iraq, UNAMI is working with the U.S. State Department to relocate the terrorists within Iraq and possibly at a U.S. military base near Baghdad's airport. James, you brought this story to me and it was news to me. So let me hear you kind of expand on this. Well, let me just say this shouldn't come as as news in the sense that we've never heard anything like it. I mean, obviously, we've seen the U.S. working with uh, various and funding and training and equipping various terrorist organizations around the world for decades. And we're not just talking ancient history like the forming of Al Qaeda in Af Afghanistan in the 80s. Uh, we're talking about uh, all sorts of uh, uh, terrorist organizations that the U.S. has been directly and admittedly involved with, including the uh, Jundala terrorist organization, a Balaki terrorist organization that's been fighting uh, in Iran and responsible for the deaths of uh, and, and or woundings of over 500 Iranian citizens over the last eight years. So, um, and, and uh, people might cast their mind back was, uh, something like a year ago when Abdul Malik Rigi, the head of Jundala, got captured and uh, he spilled, his, uh, spilled the beans to the Iranians. Um, he was talking about how he had been uh, meeting with the U.S. representatives. Uh, he was arrested on his way to Kyrgyzstan to go to the Manas Air Base, which I just released a video about mm. um, where the U.S. has an air base in Kyrgyzstan, a very important air base. And uh, so we've seen this type of story again and again and again. So again, it's nothing particularly new in that sense, but it is uh, just another piece of the puzzle and just another data point on the graph that shows uh, just how uh, Terrorism is, is truly just a tool, it's just a device that, uh, that the U.S. Uh, State Department can use as just another, I guess, piece on the chessboard that they can move uh, wh when they need and where they need. And if they want to destabilize Iran, they just fund another terrorist organization to go in and start killing people there. And uh, we've seen it before, we'll see it again, this is one of their favorite tricks, and it'll come out and it be completely and openly admitted like it is in this case, and it'll still be, in the minds of many people out there, a conspiracy theory to talk about such things. Well, I mean, why would you talk about this when we could watch the new trailer for The Dark Knight Rises or whatever everybody's rabbling about? James, as we close out this episode, I'll again remind folks of, of that link to the flashback episode of last year about North Korea and the death of Kim Jong-il with an eye towards next week's episode, which will, I believe, in, in some way look back and look forward to 2012. Absolutely. I hope people will stay tuned for that. And, uh, and also, just on a programming note, I will be taking next week off of my live radio program, but I'll still be coming out with uh, videos during that time so people can continue to stay tuned to this channel. Excellent. Thanks so much, James. Thank you.